with such a spirited rendition of that song, you should be ready to receive the word of God. We call our worship this morning from Psalm 121, the first and second verses, and the seventh and the eighth verses. Hear the word of God. I will lift up mine eyes to the mountains. Some translations have the hills. Very fitting that we use this passage this morning since so many of our folks are up in the mountains today. So I'll lift up mine eyes unto the mountains. And the second part says, from whence does my help come? The question. And then the answer comes that my help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and earth. And in the last two stanzas of this, this Psalm 7 and 8, he gives us a promise here. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming out from this time forth and forevermore. Hear the word of the call. The call of the worship to God, the proof of God's amazing love is this, that while he, we were sinners, Christ died for us. And so now let us stand and sing together hymn 288, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. <coughs> Proof of God's amazing grace is the love from Him. And while we were sinners, Christ died for this for us. And thus it is with confidence that we approach the throne of God's grace by our faith in Christ Jesus. Let us pray together the prayer of confession. Let us pray. O oh God, you have spoken to us in the voice of conscience, in the words of Scripture, in the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Yet we have not obeyed your voice. You have called us to a life of love, to the forgiving of each other, to the helping of those in need. Yet we have served mainly ourselves and have been heedless to those in need. Still you sent Jesus Christ, our Savior, who died that we might be forgiven. For his sake, hear us as we say, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And when you hear, forgive and save, for we pray in Christ's name, amen. Remain standing for a moment of silent prayer in your own way, thanking God for his love and mercy. Receive grace upon grace. Grace and truth have come to us through Christ, in Jesus Christ. We are forgiven.
Please be seated. At this time, it is our privilege to participate in the sacrament of baptism as Mike and Paula Johnson present their infant daughter for the sacrament. The elder sponsor is Joe Ramsey. And uh, Mary Catherine has three older brothers who are here to uh, celebrate with her. Bradford and Cameron and Parker are here to celebrate and to participate in the sacrament of baptism. Pleasure, too, to have family and friends here sitting on these pews up front, and we're thankful for your presence this Sunday. Let us hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus and sure of his presence with us, we baptize those whom he has called to be his own. In Jesus Christ, Mark and Paula, God has promised to forgive our sins and has joined us together in the family of faith, which is his church. He has delivered us from darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. In Christ Jesus, God has promised to be our Father and to welcome us as brothers and sisters of Christ. So Mike and Paula know that the promises of God are for you, and for your children. By baptism, God puts his sign on you and them to show that all of you belong to him and gives you Holy Spirit as a guarantee that sharing Christ's reconciling work, you and they will also share his victory, that dying with Christ to sin, you and they will be raised with him to newness of life. In presenting your daughter for baptism, you announce your faith in Jesus Christ and show that you want her to study him, know him, love him, and serve him as a chosen disciple. Will you show your purpose by answering these questions? Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Do you trust in him? Do you intend your daughter to be his disciple, to obey his word, and to show his love? Thank you. Our Lord Jesus Christ ordered us to teach those who are baptized. Do you, the people of this church, promise to tell this new disciple, Mary Catherine Johnson, the good news of the gospel, to help her know all that Christ commands, and by your fellowship to strengthen her family ties with the household of God. If you do, please say, we do. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your faithfulness promised in this sacrament and for the hope we have in your son Jesus. As we baptize with water, baptize us with Holy Spirit, so that what we say may be your word and what we do may be your work. By your power, may we be made one with Christ our Lord in common faith and purpose. O God, who called us from death to life, we give ourselves to you and with the church through all ages. We thank you for your saving love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. What is the full name of the child? Mary Catherine Johnson. Mary Catherine Johnson, child of the covenant. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and abide with you both now and forevermore. Amen. We have witnessed the baptism of Mary Catherine Johnson, and we have welcomed her into the body of Christ, and we become extensions of her family. For she will know of the love and the grace of God in Jesus Christ as that will flow through you, members of the family, members of the body of Christ, all of us who profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We become channels of God's Holy Spirit to work in her life so that one day she will confirm these vows for herself when she makes her profession of faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior. Well, Parker and Bradford and Cameron, are you ready to take the walk as we present your baby sister to the congregation, part of our church family? Okay. The water woke her up real well. Peter, the Acts of the Apostles, in his sermon says, 
Repent and be baptized for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off. So in our tradition of the Christian faith, we baptize both adults and children, symbolizing that the power and the salvation of God comes to us in our weakness. We do not earn it. Salvation is a gift. And so the weakness of a child reminds us that salvation comes to us in our vulnerability and our weakness to save us. The power of God's love through the power of the Holy Spirit and the Church of Jesus Christ is that power which brings us to faith in our immediate family and the church family, whereby always we know that Jesus Christ is our Savior and is our Lord, but we are children all, children of the covenant. And so we celebrate Mary Catherine's baptism this day. And we thank our older brothers for being in this procession. Thank you. Sometimes I had them reach for the mic and want to talk too, but. Uh... <clears throat> Let us have our closing prayer. Gracious God, we praise you for calling us to be a servant people and for gathering us into the body of Christ. And so we thank you for adding to the church universal this day, Mary Catherine. Together may we live in your spirit and so love one another that we may have the mind of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom we give honor and glory forever. Amen. Let us stand as we sing our baptismal response. At this time, we participate in the ritual of friendship and I invite all of you who are here to do so as we reflect the oneness of the body of Christ as we gather for worship members and guests alike. For those of you who are guests and visitors, there is a card in front of you with a red ribbon on it. If you're so inclined, it would assist us greatly if you would put that red ribbon on so that worshipers sitting in front of you or behind you who do not have the benefit of the friendship head may acknowledge you as a guest or visitor and extend to you a warm greeting this Sunday. A special welcome as well to those of you who are worshiping with us by way of television. We are First Presbyterian Church of Raleigh, North Carolina. We are located across from the state capitol at the corner of West Morgan and Salisbury Streets. And if your schedule permits, uh, at some time in the future, we look forward to welcoming you here in this sanctuary at First Presbyterian Church. If you're here as a guest or visitor and you're looking for a church home, we invite you to join with us in Christian discipleship. There is a place to check on the friendship page, your interest in becoming a member or in receiving information or in receiving a visit. And if you desire information today, there's an officer present uh, up front after the service in the Anderson Session Room who is prepared to talk with you about how one becomes a member by transfer of letter, by reaffirmation of faith, or by profession of faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior. And there's also the procedure as well of affiliate membership, which is particularly helpful for students uh, studying in one of the area colleges and universities, or for individuals who are here for a short period of time because of business. You do not transfer your letter, but for a period of two years, which can be renewed, uh, you identify with this community of faith for your spiritual nurture and for your service. As well, for our television audience, we're pleased to have with us uh, the Meredith College Choir and the direction of Dr. Suzanne Pence, we're thankful for their presence in worship and also for the services of Houston Black, a commissioned lay preacher in the Presbyterian Church of the Presbytery of New Hope. At the close of the worship service today, we invite all of you who are here for a time of fellowship and coffee in the Balkan Parlor. Uh, it's a large room, may not accommodate all of you, but it would be nice to try one Sunday to see how many could squeeze in for fellowship and for coffee. So if your time permits, uh, I look forward uh, to greeting you uh, in the, and talking with you in the uh, Balkan Parlor at the close of the service. It is good for us to be in worship on this second Sunday 
of this season of Lent. Our hymn is the hymn, In Christ There Is No East to West, hymn 439. I only participated in the baptism the same as the rest of the congregation did, although as a commissioned lay preacher, there are certain things which I can do. My granddaughter, eight years old, was recently with us, and we were, somebody said something about this job I was doing, and I, her other grandfather is a retired uh, Methodist minister. And so she said, Papa, what can you do in this capacity? And I, <laughs> I said, well, I cannot marry people and I cannot baptize them. And she said, oh, you can't do the important things. <laughs> One of the most important things that we do is the, is the sacrament of baptism. Now we come to the Old Testament lesson, which comes to us from Genesis, the 12th chapter, the first four verses. Somebody says, I take my little Bible down and read its pages, or... And when I part from it, I find I'm stronger than before. And so we come to that part of the, of the service where we do take time to read together and listen carefully to the Word of God as it comes to us. This is Abraham is being called from God. You remember he was called earlier from Ur of the Chaldees, and he and his father and family have moved down to Haran, which is uh, one of the passageways then to into Canaan. So they're close to Canaan. His father has just died, and so God is calling him now to prepare him to go into the land of Canaan. And said, now said the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram accepted God's call and went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him also. The word of God to the people of God. We continue our reading of scripture from the Epistle of Paul to the Romans, the fourth chapter, verses 13 through 17, followed by the Gospel lesson from the Gospel of John, chapter four, verses four through verses 30. As we consider for our topic this Sunday, breaking barriers, hear now the word of God. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be heirs, Faith is null, and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends upon faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of us all, as it is written. 
I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Continuing now into our gospel lesson. But he, meaning Jesus, had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sithka, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. And this is in parentheses. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food, in a parenthesis. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? In brackets. Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans, in a bracket. Jesus answered her, If you knew the, the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came, and they were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want, or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who has told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Breaking barriers is very difficult. It involves mental energy and spiritual energy, sacrifice. Sometimes it, is, it takes centuries for it to be accomplished. In 1954, a medical barrier was crossed when Johannes Edward Stalk produced a vaccine which could deal with infantile paralysis, a dreaded disease which maimed and crippled and killed individuals for centuries. John Wesley, though, crossed a spiritual barrier. 
an, an Anglican priest on a missionary journey to the Americas. He was on board ship in a severe storm, and he feared for his life, and he wondered at the calmness of Moravians on board, who in the midst of that storm prayed and seemed to have a sense of serenity about them. And when he returned to London, he visited a Moravian meeting house on Aldersgate Street. On May 24, 1738, he had a spiritual awakening. A barrier was crossed. Other barriers are crossed politically, whereby people of goodwill attempt to achieve peace among former warring factions. There were the Camp David Accords initiated by President Jimmy Carter, which resulted in a treaty between Egypt and Israel. And there have been attempts since between the Palestinians and the, Isra and, and the Israelis. A fragile peace which is being torn asunder now by extremists planting bombs, attempting to sabotage the whole process. The Accords in South Africa shattering and crossing the barrier of apartheid. The Canton, Ohio Accords, a fragile peace in which we are participating now with troops on the ground among people who hate each other for centuries, Croats and Serbs and Bosnians. Crossing barriers is difficult. It's painful. Jesus as Messiah confronts a Samaritan woman at a well, and several spiritual barriers are crossed, barriers which are symbols of death, barriers, symbols of that which has been conditioned by sin. And so this Sunday, as those who profess Jesus Christ, who acknowledge that we have been forgiven, that our barrier has been crossed to us, we acknowledge, yes, even in our own spiritual pilgrimage, how difficult it is for us to accept these barriers which have been crossed because they force us, confront us with, with people whom we despise, people whom we do not accept, institutions we have rejected. But because barriers have been crossed in the name of Jesus Christ, we too must cross those barriers as Christ has crossed them for us and leads us to cross them. And so our topic on this Sunday in Lent, crossing barriers. Here in our gospel lesson, three barriers are crossed, which are symbols of a host of other barriers which are crossed because of Jesus being Messiah. Here there is mentioned the barriers of race, of gender, of closed religious systems. And what Jesus does with the Samaritan woman becomes a symbol, a model for how all other barriers are crossed because Jesus is Messiah, the Christ who crosses the barrier of sin to release us from that bondage and who calls us in ministry as disciples to do likewise, to cross barriers conditioned by sin. So the first barrier crossed with the encounter with the Samaritan as a woman at the well is the barrier of, of race. Jesus is there, it's about noon, and this woman comes with her jaw and he takes the initiative. He says, give me a drink. According to Oriental custom, a person could do that. But she, acknowledging the tension between Jews and Samaritans, says, how is it, this is the language, you can almost sense the hostility in it, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews and Samaritans don't mix. There was a deep hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans, which went back from the time of the return of the Jews from captivity in Babylon for over 400 years. But 400 years seems like a long time. But when we consider what's going on in the Balkans, that animosity and that hatred is embedded for over 600 years, going back to the time of the Turkish victory and the latter part of the fourth, 14th century. Hatred embedded, conditioned, passed along. We wonder why the, 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 the camp and the courts can't simply just take place. It's hard to root out centuries of hostility and hatred. But Jesus takes the initiative, symbolizing the love of God which reaches out and crosses a barrier conditioned by sin. What happens here is you know, remember your biblical history and these young ladies take courses in religion at Mary the College and others of you have perhaps have studied that in Sunday school or elsewhere. 
Remember that the origin for this, though, goes back to when the northern kingdom of Israel fell to the Assyrians in 720. And the Assyrians had a conquering policy of deporting people but bringing people in. And the people whom they brought in intermarried with the Jews who were there. Racial purity was lost. Well, finally, at one point, the southern kingdom of Judah fell to the Babylonians in 587. The Jewish leaders were carried off into captivity. Most of them did not intermarry. And when they were able to come back to Jerusalem under leadership of Nehemiah and Ezra, when Cyrus released them, when they came back, racial purity became the litmus test for social and religious acceptance. The temple was rebuilt in Jerusalem, but people who were considered outcasts were not invited to worship there, and so the Samaritans built their rival temple on Mount Gerizim. Jews and Samaritans had nothing to do with each other. It was animosity inbred and passed on from generation to generation. It was carried on to the extreme that during the Maccabean Revolt, when one of the Maccabean generals, John Hykins, in fighting for liberation from Greek culture in 129, took the opportunity also to destroy in the process the Samaritan temple of worship on Mount Gerizim. Samaritans worshiped God as the Jews did. Their worship was the worship of the Jewish faith, but Jews and Samaritans did not get along. Jesus takes the initiative to cross this barrier to show what can happen when the love of God reaches out to deal with the prejudice of sin, a barrier of sin which is as death as ashes. Earlier in John's Gospel, John had alluded to this, this nature of Messiah. For we know the passage learned in Sunday School 316, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He didn't, like, didn't love part of the world or the black part of the world, the red part of the world, the brown or the yellow, or just the white or whatever. The world. God so loved the world. Jesus demonstrates that through him all human beings and all ethnic racial groups must deal with the barrier of death the barrier of prejudice, which excludes others that somehow they are, which means that somehow they are inferior to me. The barrier of racial prejudice is crossed. And that becomes a, a symbol to us of what we must do in terms of our own Christian faith, in terms of how we reach out to people who are different, of different ethnic backgrounds, different racial groups. It's still a problem today, dear friends in Christ this barrier of racial prejudice and ethnic prejudice. What has been going on at Fort Bragg in terms of what has been discovered there by the, by, by the Army is a microcosm of, of what is pervasive across the United States because those folks there at Fort Bragg are not from North Carolina mainly. They're from all over the United States. Only a small portion of those folks there are from North Carolina. Racial prejudice is still with us. It is difficult for us even as Christians to give up those barriers which define us in relationship to other groups whereby we think that somehow we are superior and other people are inferior. But Jesus as Messiah calls upon us if we claim the power of the Messiah to do just that. Well, the second barrier which is crossed simultaneously with the first is that of gender. Women as a general rule in Jesus' day had an inferior status it was against all religious and social protocol to address a woman in public, and Jesus shatters that protocol. No one was around to know about it. It was just him and the woman, but yet he does it. But she picks up on him, picks up on that signal. You ask a drink of me, a woman? She knows the stigma of what it is be considered inferior. You ask a drink of me, a woman? Elsewhere we read that Jesus stopped the stoning of a woman caught in adultery and he said, he who is without sin cast the first stone. The implication is 
Why is there a double standard here? Where is the man who was caught in adultery? The Apostle Paul reminds us about the nature of the Messiah who crosses this gender in terms of who we are as children of worth unto God, male and female. When he writes in Galatians 3, 428, there is neither male nor female for you are one in Christ Jesus. But you may be thinking, well, there's that Ephesians passage from Ephesians 5 where there's this beautiful analogy between Christ and the church as the bridegroom as the analogy between the husband and wife. And it is a beautiful analogy about the leadership of the husband in marriage. But unfortunately, that analogy there has been used to keep women in submission, to, be, to keep women in bondage, and people forget the verse which precedes it, verse 21 of that beautiful passage in Ephesians 5. Be ye subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. And you cannot be subject to one another, another unless there is an equal subjection. And the individual who claims Jesus Christ, the husband or the wife, providing leadership because of what Christ has done, then lifts up his wife as a co-partner with him. Susie Sharp died this week. She worshiped here on Wednesdays, many, many Wednesdays, for years when she was with the Supreme Court of North Carolina. Read her interesting biography as put in the newspaper, re recapping her life. This woman, overcoming all obstacles to become first an attorney, practicing with her father, then representing her town, then being selected as a, as a, jur a judge, and then to become the chief justice, a chief justice a forerunner, a forerunner. Jesus crosses that barrier of gender, reminding us that we are male and female created in the image of God, all children of worth. There are no inferior and superior rankings among male and female. And the third barrier which is crossed is the barrier of closed religious systems. For there is this tension here between the Samaritans who worship on Mount Gerizim and the Jews who worship in Jerusalem. You worship in one place or you worship in the other. And this woman reminds Jesus about that. Closed religious systems are harmful. Closed religious systems foster biases shaped by sin which cause inhumane things to be done to others in the name of religion. And unfortunately, uh, the history of, of humankind is replete with these tragedies of things being done in the name of religion because of closed religious systems. The history of what goes on in the Balkans is because of hatreds which are deep-seated. Eastern Orthodox against Roman Catholic, Roman Catholic against Eastern Orthodox, Christians against Muslims, Muslims against Christians. Six centuries or more. The Waldensians, we have representatives in this church who are members from the Waldensian clan, some from Valdez in North Carolina. Read the history of the Waldensians dating back to the time of Francis of Assisi, followers of Peter Waldo, who were hounded and killed like rabbits for five centuries before they sought refuge in the mountains of northern Italy and southern Switzerland. And at the time of the Reformation, they came into the Reform wing en masse. But they were persecuted because of a closed religious system which did not accept them as being orthodox in the Christian faith. And today, we Christians among ourselves will label others. You're not a valid Christian because you have not been baptized the right way. Or you're not a valid Christian because you do not accept apostolic secession of the one officiating around the table going back to Peter. Closed religious systems whereby we can justify fencing off the church from others, or even persecuting someone else in the name of religion, even in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus, as he deals with this issue, which is a serious issue, calls to attention to this woman that God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. 
The God who is reaching across to you, across all these barriers, is the God who is reaching across to you now in your sinful state. Yes, he acknowledges. <laughs> She's had a series of relationships, sexual liaisons with individuals. But the God through him who reaches out to her is the one who crosses all barriers. For the God who reaches out to her is the God who is worshipped in spirit and in truth, and that God is universal and is for everyone who can come to him, God, come to the God through Jesus Christ, through the Messiah. For he says, I am he. The one who is speaking and dressing to you is the Messiah. God is the God of all through the Messiah. And the passages read from Genesis and Romans underline that Abraham is called to be the father of a people through whom the Messiah is to come, a light to the nations. And Paul reaffirms that, that Abraham is to be a blessing to all people. All individuals who come to God through faith are one with each other. God is not someone who is boxed up in Jerusalem or in Mount Gerizim or in Geneva or in Rome, or in Edinburgh, or any other centers whereby churches which are Christian claim as their capitals of faith. All barriers are crossed. Barriers shaped by sin. And thus these three barriers here become symbols for us of what must be done in terms of coming to grips but those painful areas where we too must cross those barriers and acknowledge the power of a crucified and risen Lord to do so. And to do that, we must come to grips with the nature of forgiveness and our capacity to forgive and more, to say it more pointedly, our resistance to forgive. For in the second place, as these barriers are crossed, we are, mind, we are reminded by reading this passage that Jesus as Messiah calls upon us to forgive as we have been forgiven. This woman becomes a symbol of all human beings who have sinned, all of us who hide behind barriers. But as we journey to Calvary during this season of Lent, we are mindful of the humiliation and suffering of our Lord, and we are mindful what it is to be a forgiven Christian. We must deal with our resistance to forgive another because of a barrier of hatred, of animosity. And I close with a story about Andrew Jackson, an aged man who comes to make a profession of faith. And this is from the history book. Andrew Jackson had never made a public profession of faith until late in life. And he came before the session and the minister of the Hermitage Presbyterian Church outside of Nashville, Tennessee. And the session and the pastor were aware of the many feuds he had been in, the many duels he had been in, his acrimonious behavior, and really vindictiveness against those whom he labeled as his enemies, against himself, and particularly against his wife. And so at the close of this, the pastor says to Mr. Jackson, General Jackson, are you able to forgive all your enemies? Jackson pauses, and he says, well, I can forgive all of my political enemies, but I will not forgive those who malign me in my duty to my country, nor those who slandered my wife, sir. The fire still comes out <laughs> from old Hickory. And there's a pause, and the pastor says, sir, making a profession of faith in Jesus Christ reminds you that God in Christ forgives you. Jesus was bruised by his enemies, yet he forgave them. Are you able, sir, to forgive those who have bruised you? For to forgive is a measure of strength, not weakness, as we do it in the power of a crucified and risen Lord. And Jackson pauses, his lips about to speak, as the historian writes it. And then he others, sir, I will try to forgive my enemies. Crossing barriers must 
in the end deal with the problem of our heart. Whether we're truly open to the forgiveness of Christ so that we too in turn may forgive. For to cross barriers, the heart must be changed. Your heart must be changed. Our heart must be changed. Paul gives us the spiritual fortitude to do this when in Ephesians 2, 13 and 14 he writes, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace in his flesh, meaning on the cross, he has brought both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, meaning the barrier. The living Christ stands before us who has crossed all barriers to reach us with salvation and the gift of forgiveness which we have claimed in our confession of sin and the assurance of pardon this day. But in our pilgrimage to Calvary, we must live the crossing of barriers every day. All barriers. But most importantly, we must deal with the individual personal barrier, our resistance to forgive and to accept. But the Lord stands in front of us and says, I am he. I am he. I am he. Amen. Across this world, the millions of Christians today profess their faith in Jesus Christ through the Apostles' Creed. It was one of the methods by which the number of barriers were overcome to, so it could evolve. So as members of the body of Christ, let us respond to the good news by standing and affirming our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed, which is found on page 14 in the hymnal if you need it. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us offer to God now our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for Jesus who taught us what it means to be obedient unto death. In Jesus' earthly ministry, he showed us the way of discipleship. And as we move toward Calvary during these 40 days, enable us to sense with awe and deep appreciation the humiliation and the suffering which our Lord Jesus Christ accomplished on our behalf so that we might be released from all forms of bondage to sin and death, so that all barriers may be crossed. Hear now our prayers of intercession. We pray for those whose relationships are in disarray, spouse against spouse, friend against friend, family member against family member, colleague at work against colleague at work. We pray for those whose faith is being tested today O oh, compassionate God, who feel they somehow are unworthy to be a follower or, or who are in anger. O oh, God, because of their personal trials and deep disappointments which would enable individuals to be wounded by life and to doubt, give the strength of your spirit, heal and sustain and give encouragement. O oh, merciful God, renew this weary world bruised by sin, heal the hurts of all your children, and to bring about your peace in Christ Jesus. 
Jesus, who through the blood of the cross has broken down all barriers and breached all walls and has built a bridge to us, we pray for those who govern nations of the world. We pray for people in countries ravaged by strife or warfare. And we pray for all who work for peace and international harmony. We pray for all who strive to save the earth from destruction. And we pray for the Church of Jesus Christ in every land. O oh God of compassion, here in Raleigh we ask that you will enable us to be generous in our compassion and with our material resources for ministry to the poor and the needy. May we recognize that all are your children. May we never forget the words of Jesus, even though these individuals are unsightly, even though they are dis distasteful to our senses. May we hear the words of Jesus that as we did it to one of the least of these, our brothers and sisters, we did it unto you. O divine physician, we ask that you would be with those who have lost loved ones and will remember uh, Lee and Bell and the loss of her husband, Sam, and Lola Tyson and the loss of her husband, Luther, and Ruli Tali and the death of his mother. And remember to Lamont Mitchell, one of our teachers in the GED program at, at our Outreach Ministry Center, who lost his loved one, June, to brain cancer this, this, this week. We ask, too, that you would give grace and strength to those in hospital, to those receiving radiation and chemotherapy, those convalescing from surgery, those facing surgery, yes, even those facing death, be especially with their families and loved ones who stand with them and who support them. O gracious God, we offer these prayers in the strong name of our Savior, who has taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May we worship God with the receiving of our tithes and our gifts, symbols of our commitment and our discipleship, that they may be transformed into avenues of service and of ministry and of salvation, giving hope in the name of Jesus Christ.
in peace and have courage. And may the power which comes to us through a Christ who forgives us, equip us to move past any resistance we might have, to cross any barriers, whereby we may reach out with the good news of the gospel to others, to show the power of what it is to claim victory over sin and death. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you, both now and forevermore.